Welcome to the Jed Burke Podcast. I'm the creator and host, Fran Rachopi. Each episode, I speak with transformative leaders, visionaries, drivers of change, and those dedicated to winning no matter the challenge. The Jedberg Podcast is founded in a lineage of the special operations Jedberg teams of the past and is produced in partnership with Talent War Group, a management consulting and executive search firm focused on helping you optimize the people side of your business. We're sponsored by Jersey Mike Subs. Together, we share the mission of giving, making a difference in someone's life. Visit the Jedberg Podcast, Talent War Group, and Jersey Mike Subs on the web and on all social media. A percentage of all proceeds is dedicated to the Green Beret Foundation, supporting America's special forces and their families. We talk about the missions, providing information to policymakers, but you do it in such a way where honesty and integrity is the foundation from the day you walk in that building. And people think that's counterintuitive. It's the CIA. Everyone's prepared for this. We knew something like this might happen. So we're going to do our best to get out of this situation. I was authentic. And afterwards, I got a lot of good feedback on that. The irony, of course, is when someone said, hey, you look really calm. And I was like, crap in my pants. I thought I was going to die that day. I was terrified. I woke up in the middle of the night with the room spinning, splitting migraine, tinnitus, which is ringing in my ears, vertigo. And it started this kind of five-year journey. And what I believe happened was similar to what happened to our officers and U.S. diplomats in Havana, Cuba in 2016, the year prior, which is that there was some kind of attack on us. It's a sonic attack, directed energy, whatever it is. The Central Intelligence Agency solves our nation's most complex international challenges in peacetime, war, and everything in between. But to do so, the CIA, or any organization for that matter, needs dynamic and impactful leaders. Leaders who develop a style and principles that drive results, take care of people, and accomplish the mission when failure is never an option. I'm joined in this episode by one of the CIA's most impactful leaders most people have never heard about. A small fact that's by design. Mark Polymeropoulos served 26 years in the CIA, leading operations across Europe, Eurasia, Asia, Afghanistan, Iraq, and many of the world's most dangerous places. Mark recently released his book, Clarity in Crisis, Leadership Lessons from the CIA, in which he lays out what it takes to inspire and get the best from others, even when asked to do the seemingly impossible. Mark and I cover how to build organizations that win by conducting activities that are righteous, difficult, selfless, and communicable. Great leaders also develop and implement a strategy. So I challenge Mark to show us how to implement his nine strategies for leading when we don't always have all the answers, but we still need to take action. We cover the glue guy, the process monkey, adversity, humility, why leaders need to win an Oscar, family values, people development, employing the dagger, and finding clarity in the shadows. Mark spent a career battling our nation's biggest adversaries. Today, he fights the biggest challenge of his life after he was attacked by pulsed electromagnetic energy in a Russian hotel in 2017. Known as Havana Syndrome, these attacks have been reported all over the world against American diplomatic personnel. After years of investigation, no consensus has been found within the U.S. government and not enough has been done to support the victims, who, like Mark, struggle to focus, suffer debilitating headaches, vision issues, and loss of motor function. Mark shares his story, that of others who've been attacked by pulsed electromagnetic energy, and what we have to do as a country to support them and stop this. Take a listen to my conversation with Mark on your favorite podcast platforms. Watch the full video version from Mark's Sunroom on YouTube. Pick up a copy of Mark's book, Clarity in Crisis, Leadership Lessons from the CIA to learn more about his strategies and implement them in your organization today. Follow him on Twitter at mpolymer and on the web at markpolymeropolis.com. Subscribe and follow at Jedberg Podcast on all social media and check out our website, jedbergpodcast.com. Mark, welcome to the Jedberg Podcast. Good to be here. Thanks. Thanks for hosting us at your house. Absolutely. It's good old Vienna, Virginia. <laughs> it's, well, it's a beautiful day in Vienna, Virginia. <laughs> 26 years in the CIA, started as an analyst, quickly transitioned over to becoming a case officer in the operations directorate. Your last position was overseeing all CIA clandestine operations in Europe and Eurasia. The recipient, and I saw some stuff on the wall downstairs that we're going to get you with pictures of later, <laughs> but Distinguished Intelligence Medal, the Intelligence Medal of Merit, the Intelligence Commendation Medal, and the Distinguished Career Intelligence Medal, plus probably a few that we don't know about and haven't listed here. Many people forget and don't understand or even know, nor maybe they should know, how closely the CIA and special operations work together. And one of many of the highlights of my career overseas has always been working with the agency and being as integrated as we were with them. And those were always the most successful missions. We're born from the same place. And you sold me on this book <laughs> on page three of the introduction when you spoke about the OSS and the Jedbergs, because it is 
hard coded into our epi- into every episode outro where I say that the Jedbergs, American Jedbergs, went on to become the operations directorate of the CIA, right. which then many of them were spun off in the early 50s to become Green Berets. So I sincerely appreciate you no, putting that into the book sure. because nobody yeah. does. <laughs> I mean, that was, you know, that to me, that was kind of the essence of what we did. You know, it's the idea of, of you know, defending forward. You know, there, you know, I think, well, with the withdrawal of, you know, from Afghanistan and a lot of kind of the, the pain that, that a lot of us felt on this, it was because, you know, we had friends there, you mm-hmm. know, the indigenous units um, uh, who we left behind. And, and, you know, people always talk about being deployed. Well, we always are. Yeah. Whether it's where, whether you're, you know, a CIA case officer um, or you're, you know, in the special operations community, you know, we don't come home and that's what you sign up for. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it, and so to me, it was never, never a question of, of, you know, staying in Afghanistan or not. I thought we, I, I thought we should have stayed. I, I wish we had. Um, but again, it's just that idea of, of working with these indigenous units. And that's what the Jedburg teams were all about. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. And you're also a Boston Red Sox fan. I am. Which is pictures on the wall and it was in the book. And so I appreciate that too. So. Crazy Red Sox. I, some of my leadership principles, I, you know, when I wrote the book, there's all these references to baseball there and, and the Red Sox. Mm-hmm. One of the cool things uh, that, that I'll, I'll give kind of the listeners a, a hint on is I was, I was on TV um, a couple of weeks ago and I was talking about Russia, Ukraine. Mm-hmm. And I made the analogy of that Ukraine was going to shock the world, just like Kevin Millar yeah. said. <laughs> and he actually was watching. And he was contacted he really? someone. And he's going to come up here, and we're going to give him a, t- a, a tour of CIA headquarters. Oh, that's so. And awesome. so people don't realize this. Like, like, so I'm like a fanboy here. It's embarrassing. Like, he's like, oh, I'm going to go hang out with some cool CIA guys and gals. I'm like, what are you kidding me? I'm going to hang out with Ken Millar. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and then I'll tell you where he's going to go next. He's going to come on the Jedberg exactly. podcast. <laughs> so I'm going to hold you to that. We had Jerry Remy. Oh, so Jerry Remy. Legend. So yeah. their youngest son, Jordan, was my best friend growing up. Still my oh, best friend. Wow. And uh, I grew up in their house. And so episode three, Jerry Remy, the late Jerry Remy, I was at their at his funeral last year, um, but uh, instrumental in the starting of the Jedberg podcast. No kidding. Because just like I mentioned to you, Jack Divine, right. so, you know, from your heritage world, at the yeah. agency has been on a few times, but they were in that group of four or five people along with Jersey Mike's founder, Peter Cancro, that I called two years ago Amazing. this month and right. said, hey, if I start a podcast... Would you number one? What do I do? Right. And, and and do you think this is a great idea? And if I do, will you be one of my first guests? And so Jerry was was episode three and was instrumental in the that's crafting amazing. of the message for this podcast. Mm. And so uh, we take a uh, you know I'm in, here in Virginia now, but we take a kind of a pilgrimage every summer to up to Fenway. Um, so my son and I went with this past year, and and so through some friends, um, you know the Red Sox uh, uh, kind of management had said, hey, you know Mark, we want to honor mm-hmm. you. Um, for your service, you know, we're we, you know, give you some tickets, and and you know, we'll we'll have you go behind the monster, the green monster, oh. and actually sign it. I got it, my son and I did it, um, and then we actually went. It was Yankees Red Sox, and we went, and they stuck us in the outfield, and we we're kind of shagging fly balls. Oh, that's awesome! As the Yankees were taking BP, but there, there's a there's a story behind this. I'm also I'm a serious Red Sox fan, so I'm not thrilled at, at the direction of the team. Yeah, so r- I went roughly. back on Twitter, and I'm crazily deleting all my <laughs> tweets about Chaim Bloom, the general manager, who I'm perpetually angry at because I'm like, oh, crap, they're, they're honoring me to go up there. I got to get rid of all this stuff. So. Yeah, it lives forever on, oh, the, on it the internet. Yeah, so. <laughs> but now I'm back to being You're pissed because I don't know how the offseason is going to go. But, oh, yeah. It's yeah. a rough year. We yep. can't talk about it. Well, let's talk about building great organizations sure. like like the Red Sox. They have in flow, but it starts with a mission. Yep. And – That is the mission is the unifying edict that bonds everybody together, whether you're in the military or baseball team, you're in the CIA, special operations, government agencies are the best at it. Businesses, I would argue, not so much. And that's one of the things that we spent a lot of time talking about on the Jedberg podcast is how do you, where do you start? Everyone says, I want to build a great organization. Great. I mean, nobody wakes up every day and says, I'm going to build a shitty organization and hire bad people, but you have to have a mission for as a green beret. De oppresso liber, free the oppressed. Right. And that means so many things. It's a very, it's a very right. simple term, and it can be applied anywhere in the world, peace, war, whatever level of conflict. That's At the end of the day, that's what we're doing. The mission of the CIA is simple and straightforward. Collect and analyze foreign intelligence to assist the president and other policymakers in the U.S. government in making national security. Simple statement, right. complex ta- task. Why is that de- is that mission, that definition, the alignment and the starting point 
for any organization and specifically the CIA, but sure. why is it important for any organization? So, I mean, you know, for, for us, it was, you know, we we're America's first line of defense. That's the intelligence community. I, I always joke around. Don't tell the Marines. I, that's, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, what is espionage? Well, it's the it's the second oldest profession. What's the first oldest mm-hmm. profession? And everyone kind of takes a yeah. pause. Well, it's prostitution. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I when I give these leadership talks to like, you know, high school teams, I'm like, nobody should answer this question. Right. But no, but so, so you know, but it's, it's uh, you know, the CIA was the nation's, is the nation's first line of defense. And so ultimately, we're providing information to policymakers for them to make correct decisions. And then the other part of it is on the kind of the covert action side is sometimes we influence events, but everything is based on that, that notion. Um, but you know, when you, when you walk into CIA headquarters, uh, and I, I, you know, you know, this, you know, you look to the right and it's the, the Memorial wall, which is a sacred place for us. Um, certainly not the, the same level of, of, you know, tragedy or, or death that, that the U S military has, but you know, there's 170 plus, I think it's 170 mm-hmm. now plus stars on, on the wall. And some friends of mine are on there. And then you look on the left and there's a biblical verse. Uh, and it says, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And that's another kind of foundational piece. That's about honesty and integrity. So mm-hmm. when we talk about the missions, providing information to policymakers, but you do it in such a way where honesty and integrity is the foundation, um, you know, from the day you walk in that building. And, and people think that's counterintuitive. It's the CIA, you know, right. but, you know. <laughs> What's the joke with, you know, and, and again, I'll, we could talk a little bit about our, you know, working with special operations forces, which was, again, a highlight of my career as well. Um, but, you know, I'd walk into, you know, somewhere and, and someone say, oh, the agency guys here, watch your wallet. Yeah. So everyone's, you know, we're going to, but, but honestly, it's a, it is a organization that is, that is, uh, you know, the, the foundation of it is on telling the truth. Um, and, and, you know, to, to certainly to policymakers, but also to your teammates, um, you know, your bosses, your peers, subordinates. So, so that honesty, integrity, huge. Yeah. Well, I mean, trust forms the foundation yep. of everything. You said, I never wanted to have a classic nine to five job. I wanted more, more adventure, more fulfillment, more meaning. And I was a patriot and wanted to work for the U.S. government. You went to Cornell. You earned multiple degrees there. Your parents are immigrants to the U.S., strong Greek heritage. I could tell by your last name. That's right. But I mean, my last name is Richopi. So That's I mean, I'm, you know, yeah. we're, we're 100% Italian. But it's interesting in these in these cases, my, you know, you... You know, my grandfather, I take as an example, immigrated, but all my grandparents immigrated to the U.S. from Italy. But my grandfather came here when he was eight years old and he became a chemical engineer in the U.S. Army Engineering Corps and worked on the Manhattan Project. Amazing. And his allegiance to the United States of America surpassed absolutely right. everything and it set the foundation for what and what that was instilled in me and the meaning of service. What? Why did you have this calling and coming from your background with the Greek heritage? And I know your, your dad was not always the biggest fan of the CIA. Why was it so important to serve? So what, what a great question. I, you know, the immigrant experiences, you know, I was born in Greece. Um, but and, and by the way, my wife, who is a retired agency officer as well, uh, she's a Lebanese background. Um, so, mm-hmm. so, you know, and you have this is really common, uh, you know, in, in, in the intelligence uh, community. But. But there's a couple of things. First of all, because I had this exposure kind of to the outside world, you know, every summer I'd be, you know, we were on the Greek islands. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was 10 years old, my dad who uh, did a sabbatical. He was a professor at Rutgers University, but he, he did a sabbatical in, in, uh, in North Africa and in Algeria. And so when I was 10, my mom put me on an airplane by myself at JFK airport, flying by myself through Paris <laughs> to Algeria. My dad and I. That would never happen. Never happen. Absolutely. I, mean, my, I, news, I don't let like... my kids who are in college walk down the street. <laughs> no, but so, I, so, I, so we spend a month in a Volkswagen minibus driving through the Sahara desert. And right then I said, I have to do something like this. You know, I'm, I think I'm yeah. Lawrence of Arabia. Um, <laughs> but, but there, but there's an important notion here is that people I think who come from outside the United States appreciate what we have. And, and even, even fast forwarding now with all kind of the political dysfunction in the U S and we're not talking politics today. Yeah. No, one's no, that, no, that doesn't help anybody. Um, but ultimately if you still go to a U.S. embassy, there are lines going out the door at the visa section, at the yeah. consular section, because people still think, America is is uh, is the land of uh, you know political and economic freedom, and but so so kind of having that love of country, I think is really common in the immigrant experience. It's it's fascinating to me. But you walk the halls of CIA, there is you know I, so many of my friends. Uh, well, it's that's what America is. It's a melting pot. But a lot of my friends, you know, were born outside the country. Yeah. But they end up being you know the most patriotic Americans you could ever find. Mm-hmm. No, I hundred percent agree. Everything starts. You know, we have a mission, but you need leaders, right? 
You developed nine strategies from your career to apply to leadership in any environment. The book, Clarity in Crisis, Leadership Lessons from the CIA that you wrote breaks these down. I loved this when I, when I opened it up because you started talking about nine. And I'm like, wait a minute. I talk about nine on every podcast. And we talk about the, the components of you know, special operations character and mm-hmm. what soft recruits assesses and selects for when when they're bringing people into the organization drive resiliency adaptability humility integrity curiosity that team sounds ability, pretty familiar yeah, huh? effective right. intelligence and yep. emotional strength i'm going to tie all these to your sure, principles sure. as we go through this i want to break them down and i want to talk about them but in order to get there first I want you to define leadership because I thought you had a great definition where we, and so I was hoping you take a minute in your terms, define the term leadership as the starting point for any other component that we bring in. Sure. So let me, let me just start by saying that I, you know, I don't think leaders are born. I think they're made. Absolutely. Um, And so when, when, whenever you kind of, you know, run into someone and say that, you know, I I can't be a leader. So, well, hold on a second Um, that you can be trained and, you, you know, you can do this kind of in a systematic fashion, but, one of the things that at the agency I found, actually, I was not a good leader for most of my career. And so by the end of my career, uh, I thought I was very good. And so what does that really mean to me? Well, you know, you know, first and foremost, we're talking about when times are tough. You know, it's leadership under adverse conditions where you have a lack of situational awareness. And simply, my defini- definition of leadership is who's the one who's going to stand up and raise their hand yeah. and say, hey, this is a, this is a crappy situation. I'm, I'm here. You know, I, I want to do this. I can I can attack this. And, you know, and because... I, I, you know, I, I know how to handle it. Um, I've trained for it, but, but most importantly, it's not having that fear of failure. And it took me a long time to get there, but that to me is really true leadership is when, you know, you know, you're in that kind of, what do we call it? The period of, of gray. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and, you know, every, when everyone else wants to flee, I mean, these are all cliches, yeah. but I really do believe this. Um, and it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's kind of attacking a problem with no fear. And it's and and people, you know, we've got to yep. put people first. Yes, and I always. think you know, as as leaders, that's so much of the starting point. You know, so many times we look at it and we say, well, you know, it's about me, it's about me. But it's how do we empower people to go solve problems? Special operations truth number one is people are more important than Absolutely. hardware. You well, know? and here's one other thing too. You realize, and when you when you become a good leader, you realize it's not about you. Mm-hmm. Obviously, team first. But the, the, the best leaders are the ones who surround themselves with people who are smarter than them. Yeah. And, I, and, and again, you learn that, that, and that takes actually a lot of discipline. Mm-hmm. Um, but you check your ego at the door. Um, it's not about you anymore, but it's really, it's surrounding yourself with good people and listening to them. Yeah. You know, not having the ego where when someone tells you something and you're like, you know what, you're right, let's, let's go that way. You know, and that's not a threat to you. Right. That's something you should embrace. And once you make that step, you know, uh, I, and this is within any organization, um, you know, it's, uh, it, there's, there's no way you don't prosper. So everybody who's getting ready to become a special operator, go to selection for whether it's going to be a Green Beret, Navy SEAL, you want to become an Army Ranger, you want to join the Air Force, become a pararescue man, right? They can come to you, hop on 18 Alpha Fitness app, and you're going to take them through some very specific workouts that are designed for each one of those training programs. I always start off everybody day one of 18 Alpha Fitness is uh, my push up from hell. Spider-Man push-ups. So on a down position, your left knee comes to your left elbow. Right knee comes to your right elbow. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Next one is diamonds, everybody's favorite. And make sure you get that chest off that ground. All right, wide arm. (sighs) Be on your knee, this is the knee one, but you're gonna go down. You want to take it to the next level. You want to be one of America's best. Get on 18 Alpha Fitness. Check it out. There's there's values too that exist. And one of the things that you talk about is you know, when we look at a leader's job is is to some is to identify those values that they want in their organization. We right. talked about mission, you know, we're gonna talk about some of the the principles that you mm-hmm. need. But you you spoke about developing a values system of th- that encompasses being righteous, difficult, selfless, selfless and yep. communicable. Right. Why why is the development of these values and putting some time in up front to think about, you know, what are my overarching themes that I want from right. my team so important? Uh, so uh, again, those are the fun those are actually to me those aren't principles, those are fundamentals. Mm-hmm. That's what you start with. 
Um, again, great leadership. You know, it's it's got to be selfless. Again, what we said before, you're you're putting you know uh, others above you, team first. Um, communicable is a huge one because you have to be able to kind of uh, uh, have everyone buy in. Yeah. You know, we can talk about this all day, but if your team, your teammates around you aren't aren't listening, well, you know, you failed right there. So what does that mean? You have to be able to communicate with them. Right. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's, you, you can do it in so many different ways, but you know, the, the, the old adage of, you know, having a closed door, um, uh, you know, of being aloof, that just doesn't work, uh, uh, at all. But, but, you know, it, it, to me, it also all, all comes down to just that, that get those fundamentals of honesty and integrity, you know, once again, that to me is it, it again, it seems so counterintuitive coming from a CIA guy, <laughs> um, but it's absolutely critical. And, and, you know, uh, uh, there's sanction on that. I mean, one thing within the agency, and I think the special operations community as well, is, you know, it, you, you take a long time to build that that trust about honesty and integrity. You can mm -hmm. lose it in a second. Oh, yeah. And once you lose it, it's done. Mm -hmm. And then you have this reputation. Hey, this is not someone who's trusted. You know, maybe they embellish something. Maybe, you know, yeah. there was some ethical lapse. Um, you lose it in a second. And you, you got to really fight against that. Yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the hardest part. You know, you can do it. You do things right 99 yep. times and then get it, you know, get it wrong one time. Yep. And, and now it becomes, why did that happen? One of my, one of my, you know, heroes, and of course, you know, I can't always talk about names, but one of my heroes uh, uh, in the job, and, uh, you know, she's a, a female uh, uh, officer, incredibly senior in the counterterrorism world, um, probably responsible for uh, saving more American lives than anyone, you know, with, you know, in the history of the United States government. But she, she taught me something and it was, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course that's yeah. a cliche, but it's very simple. And, but, it, but in, in these high risk, um, you know, operations where sometimes we fail, you know, sometimes you're gonna have to stand up and say, Hey, we screwed up. Right. Um, so having that, you know, that, that honesty and integrity is absolutely critical. So I just, I, you know, that's, and that's something I try to teach my kids and I, you know, mm -hmm. teach others in the leadership field, but just the idea of doing the right thing is, is so important. That's hard Yeah. because sometimes, you know, things go wrong and, you know, you, you got to step up. Yeah, no, I agree. Let's get into, let's sure. get into the principles. The first one is the glue guy. Yeah. And he said, at, at each of the stations I managed, I valued our support staff, the glue guys, as much as anyone else. I did not want a homogenous team of all-stars with too many egos involved, each rushing for individual glory. We talk about special operations. Truth number five, most special operations require non-soft support. You can be the greatest shooter. You can be the greatest operator right. in the world. If you if you don't have someone who who flies or fuels the helicopter, right. you will never get to the objective. So, so you get it. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, a lot of people in our old world get it, but what, what I, what I find is so often, um, you know, you know, people or, or managers will highlight the superstars. Uh, uh, but we didn't do that and you can't do that because again, you know, who, who's your, who's kind of, what's your logistics change, logistics chain, like for, you know, for in the, in the old world of, of, of CI operations, what about the analytic ca mm -hmm. cadre? What about the targeting officers who are setting you up and, and I think what what was is really interesting for me is when you have success, you have to celebrate everybody. Yeah. You know, so your door kicker is not the superstar, um, someone who got the Distinguished Intelligence Medal, um, not the superstar. I remember when I received that award in the award ceremony, I had a, kind of an epiphany then, like, well, wait a second, what about everybody who was behind me? This had to do right. with my time in Iraq, running around helping you know uh, special operations forces catch high value targets. If you remember that the Saddam was you know, the decade oh, yeah. fifty five, so mm -hmm. I was really you know you know very involved in that. Um, but I, I felt like a jerk, uh, because you know what, I never thanked everybody. And so the idea, you know, in the future is, you know, certainly make sure everyone's rewarded in any kind of success, but also include people in planning. And so when later on, when I was, you know, in management positions at the agency, we'd have a morning meeting. So who do you usually think would come to that? The, the operations officers, what are we going to do today? Who's running, you know, who has an agent meeting tonight or, you know, what kind of counter surveillance does someone have to do? Are we going to, you know, are we going to try to bump a Russian, you know, right. diplomat at a, at a, at a reception? Well, you know, so I'd gather those officers, but later on in my career, what else did I do? It's who's chief of support in the station? Who's, uh, you know, who's chief of logistics? Because guess what? We can't do any of this stuff yeah. without their input. And you just learned this. I, I learned it later on. Um, uh, a perfect example of this, you know, I gave, I gave a talk to our high school, the local high school football team, uh, uh, you know, last year. Um, and the division one quarterback who was, you know, all state going off to play, you know, or going off to play D1 football. I looked at him, I said, you know, hey, Ry, his name is Ry Yates. Dad is, his dad is a, a B1 pilot mm -hmm. uh, in the Air Force. So there's no, you know, it, he gets it. I said, who's your glue guy? And he looked over at the table of offensive linemen. He goes right there and yeah, they went crazy. That's it. that's it. I was like, I dropped the mic. We're yeah. done. You yeah. guys get it. Greatest arm in the world if you don't have time to throw a pass. That's right. Yep. Yeah. But, but celebrate that notion of, of yeah. the glue guy. Really important. I give uh, one of the talks I give on, on leadership. I put up a picture that I took. On the from the back of a Norwegian destroyer right. out in the Gulf of Aden, and so we flew from Djibouti out there. We were doing some combat search and rescue testing. Right, 
capabilities, interoperability with NATO forces. And I put the picture up and it's of the Norwegian deck crew refueling a U.S. Air Force CSAR Blackhawk. Right. And then me and three other SF guys stand in there and I say, who's the most important person in Love this it. picture? Yep. And you'll get all the answers. Oh, the pilot, right, right. you know, yep. you guys and no one. And then no one gets it right. And I look at it, I say, no way. See those guys putting the fuel That's in that right. aircraft? There you go. That's it. Yeah. So, so think about it, as a leader, so, so you celebrate them, but in planning, like if you don't have that, you know, you're not, you're not running a successful op. Yeah. And so again, it, this is, these are basic principles. One of the things about the book that I, that I kind of loved, I'm, I'm not getting an invite to go to give this at, at, you know, Harvard business. School. <laughs> you know, these are basic principles. Yeah. Um, but, but I might be able to help you with that. All right. Well, no. <laughs> so. no, but, but, but ultimately I love these because they're, they're basic, they're kind of fundamental and people get it. So my stepbrother, who's a, you know, ER doc, um, uh, in, in New York, I mean, he went through the worst times during mm -hmm. COVID. Uh, there was hunters bodies stacking up everywhere. It was, mm -hmm. it was, it was incredible. So he actually gave my book, um, uh, to, to the nurses in the ER, yeah. the glue gals or glue guys exactly. too, same thing, but, and they loved it. And of course he said, Hey, I look great after this. <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, anyway, I love that principle. It's something that, that, you know, I think just can be embraced by, you know, it, you know, people in any kind of, of profession. Yeah. It ties to our team ability. The, the next one is, ad is adversity. In, is the performance enhancing drug to success. There's a lot of noise, I think, in leadership discussions around adversity and resilience. In SF, we call it bounce back. Right. You know, and it's a great, it's gradable yep. in selection. I mean, they'll they will put you in situations designed for you to fail. I mean, same for training at the agency. Yep. You design to fail yep. solely to see how, you you know, how quickly you're gonna come back, right? But you did a great job in this book of doing something that I actually haven't seen before. And I've read a lot of books on leadership, <laughs> but you broke, made a distinction between failure, mistakes, and quitting. Right. And what I was hoping you might be able to do is define each of those and talk about why they're different and why do we as leaders need to make that differentiation, not only for ourselves, but for those who work for us when they come in and say, hey, boss, this just happened. Right. So, I mean, you know, again, adversity is something that's going to hit any organization, any team. So it's, it's really, you know, it, and you're going to define yourself in the future is, you know, how do you, how do you bounce back from that? Um, you know, and, and I think that there is a huge distinction between failure. That's going to happen. I'm sorry, it's a distinction between failing. That's mm -hmm. going to happen. But failure yeah. is quitting. Yeah. Failure is saying, all right, I'm done. I'm taking a knee and I'm not getting up. Yeah. And you never want to, you never want to, to be in that position. But I think when you, if you, if you embrace the notion that high performance teams High performing teams are going to go through adversity. That's going to be their super fuel. They're, what are you going to learn from it? You know, in the military, you do an AAR after this, mm -hmm. but in the agency, you know, it, it's, you know, kind of a, a very similar process. Um, uh, but you're not thrown in the towel uh, uh, at all. And ultimately, it's going to make you stronger. Every team that I was on, and it, all this is based on personal experiences. So I'm not, you know, just making this stuff up. Right. Every great team that I was on, something really bad happened at some point. Um, and we learned from it and we got stronger. And, you know, you didn't pack up and go home. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the, I, I tell a couple of, you know, different stories in the book. And, you know, one of the things I think why the, the book has resonated is because, you, you know, everyone loves these war stories. Yeah. So, you know, I try and make, I talk about this principle and everyone's looking Even at me. Even people who've been to war. Right. War and stories. then, and then I tell the story and they're like, oh, I get it. Again, I was doing this with a, for a college, the University of Louisiana, uh, Louisiana baseball team the other day down in, uh, in Lafayette. Um, but there was, there was two things that happened in my career over a 10 year period. One in Iraq, um, where we had recruited an agent and I was up with the, uh, living up in the mountains in, in Kurdistan with some of your old. Yep. Your old friends um, before the invasion in, in December of '02, and we had recruited an Iraqi um, who was giving us order of battle information. And of course, the Pentagon was loving this. I was in charge of paneling uh, th this agent, and we—I met him too much, um, you know, against my better instincts. Yeah. Nobody cared back home. The, the, the base chief you know, was okay with it too, but but I, I screwed up, and he got caught, and he got he got executed, and he yeah. got tortured, and he, he got executed. I'll never forget that. That was a huge failure on my part. And I, what I told myself there is, I'm never going to push an agent like that again. Right. Ten years later in Afghanistan, um, you know, I was the base chief in Taktika province at, at one of our you know frontline bases. I'm co-located again with uh, you know some uh, some of your special forces uh, old special forces colleagues, and it was a unique place because several years prior, two agency ground branch officers were killed. Mm -hmm. um, as part of what we were doing there is the high is a high value target hunt, and we had an individual who was responsible for that. Um, you know, as part of our target set. And, and very kind of patiently over time, and I was thinking back to my failure a decade prior, but we recruited agents to put this uh, uh, high value target on the X and he was, you know, 
just to safe to say removed from the battlefield and and that night as i was you know i was received from messages from all over the world this is really deeply personal for the agency right. it's a small organization so we in, in essence avenged the death of some of our colleagues um and then we we grabbed a, a you know a, a satellite phone and you know the famous thorias that we all used and we called one of the officer's widows in fort bragg mm-hmm. um uh and and just told told her what we did but as we're sitting around that night around the fire pit i call it you know caveman tv you yeah. remember those days oh yeah ranger, um, we call it ranger tv ranger tv yeah. <laughs> and so so as we're you know and i'm thinking I'm, I'm thinking okay so why did we succeed here and it was because i was you know i was just much more patient i'd, I'd learned from that terrible adversity before yeah. an agent was killed um to this success which was a deeply personal success you know did, there was no not a front page of any newspaper right. but for the agency it was really meaningful and so it's just that idea of, of of kind of of you know of not giving up, but but learning from adversity, and you know that, that becomes your super fuel. And uh, but but you, you know fail, you know you're going to fail sometimes. Um, uh, you know failure is not an option. And, and one last point on that is you know there's a, there, this is an old kind of soft adage I think you know dare to fail. Mm-hmm. So the and, and I like that because when you go through adversity, you're then not scared. Yeah. Of failing again. Okay, I've, I've you know that was bad. Look, so the, what's the example I use in the book? The 2003 Boston Red Sox. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Tim Wakefield gives up a, uh, a great knuckleball, gives up a home run to Aaron Boone. They lose in seven games. 2004, that next year, um, Red Sox are down 3 0. Kevin Millar is totally loose. Mm-hmm. And, and he says, you know, let's shock the world. And then they, the Red Sox win those four straight. If you ask any member of that Red Sox team, how did you guys do that? They said, well, that's because of last year. Yeah. Hey, we're, we're playing loose now. Right. So I think there's a lot to that. Yeah. And the resilience, the adaptability, I mean, you've got to demonstrate that. Um, I talk about that with athletes right. a lot. You know, you talk about dare to fail. Yep. You know, so so many times what you'll see with, with athletes in certain sports is, you know, they'll push themselves to a limit and they'll say, well, well, that's all I got. And yep. it's like, but you didn't fail. You know, did, right. did your body give up? Yeah. You know, did you fall down? Did you collapse? Yeah. You know, you got more and you've got to go there That's right. and not be afraid of it to know where that limit is and then you can move past it. The third principle that you have is the process mo- monkey. The process <laughs> monkey. Okay. This one this one's very simple. And and you have a great a great quote here and he said there are no shortcuts in practicing the fundamentals of the intelligence business. That's right. Why is process so important? Well, I mean, you know, again, thinking back to uh, just the notion of, you know, how do you lead in times of crisis when when there's a lack of situational awareness where you're in the gray, you're going to fall back on let's say two or three things that you've learned mm-hmm. how to do. I mean, in my mind and when I teach leadership, I always go back. There's a, there's a principle of, of people remember three things. Mm-hmm. They can't remember nine. Yeah, no, it's three. Uh, yeah. But it's it's three. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, or, or or less than that. But you know, so so I, I, I throw it out there. You know, your old community, or, or let's say you know you're you know you're a Navy SEAL. What what are two things you got to well, be able the, to do? They can only remember two right. things in Navy. So you got you know you got to be able to swim <laughs> and now shoot. The Navy I, guys will call me. No, Navy. so but I mean this is <laughs> so. But in the intelligence world, kind of the fundamental as an operations officer was was running a surveillance detection route. So, you know, when our, you know, the, the most sacred job we have is, is keeping our agents safe. These are, you know, Iranians and Russians mm-hmm. and Chinese who we recruit. Um, you know, if we can't do that, we're not in business. And, and, and a surveillance detection route is when you go from kind of point A to point B and you take a lot of things in between, you, you know, maybe you put on a disguise, maybe you're dumped out of a vehicle, but ultimately you want to make sure you're not being followed. So if you can't do that, that fundamental piece, you know, nothing happens. Right. And so that's that's the one thing that you know you, you identify. So my my challenge uh, uh, to 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 teams is, hey, you know, think of a couple things that you could that you have to be able to do when the shit hits the fan. Hey, you know what? I'm good. That I, you know, again, I, I go back to I just gave this talk to a baseball team down in Louisiana, and I said, you know, what what are you doing? If you know, if you're up and talking about athletics, I think there's so many parallels. You're up, you're you know, you're down three one. Uh, bottom of the ninth inning, you're coming up to bat, right? And, there, and there's there's a, there's a runner on second and third. If you get a, just you hit a single, you're tied up the game. It's a conference championship, and you know right. whatever division you're in. And so, what are you thinking? Are you scared going up there? No. You, what you're thinking is, you know what? I hit every day. Yeah. I did tons of kind of cage work, and you know I lifted in the off season, um, and I ate right. And when my when my boys were out mm-hmm. there partying on Friday night, I di- I didn't do it. So I did everything that I can control. I did all those things. So whatever happens now, there's uncontrollables. Whatever happens, now, maybe the ump's crappy, right? You know. So, so, but I know that I've done everything in my power. Though I did those processes that, you know what, I'm ready for this. And I think, and again, what is that? That's also freeing mm-hmm. that it goes back yeah. to the dare to fail. Look, all right, let's go. I couldn't have done anything more. You know, guess what? If you don't have that, what if you're up there and you're like, crap, you know, I took off, I took off three weeks, you know, in the winter. Right. And I didn't hit at all. And now I'm not so confident. Now there's doubt. 
Now there's doubt. Yeah, we talked about that with Andy Towers, the head coach of, of the Chaos Lacrosse team in the PLL. I've been in the championship three years in right. a row and won it last year. But he talks about that. You know, if you put everything in, then you're free. We yeah. talked and we talked about it with Jerry Remy. I mean, we were right. just and we were talking about it at the start. But I mean, I asked Jerry, I said, talk to me about the mindset of the closing pitcher when they go out there and they know that the game is on them. Right. And he said that that act that fact that they know that the game is on them and they look in the bullpen and they see that there's no one else. Right. That's it. That yeah. For those guys yeah. in a moment in which most people will, will create doubt. That's what actually motivates them because they have the understanding that I'm the only person right now right. who can solve yep. this and I got to go out and do I it. I love that. I mean, that, that goes, so let's, let's throw that into the kind of the whole uh, discussion on what, you know, uh, the intelligence community and special operations forces are there. And, and this is going to sound dramatic, but, you know, this is, you know, post 9-11, you know, we were the ones standing on the ramparts. Yeah. There's no one else. So when you kind of, you look back like, hey, is there anyone who, el who else can do this now? Well, no. So, so think about what I'm talking about, clarity and crisis. All right, I'm going to raise my hand. Let's go. Yeah. Because um, there is nobody else uh, uh, coming. But, but again, you, you got to embrace that. That's a wonderful thing. Right. And, and what, I, what I would tell new officers coming in uh, to the agency all the time is I said, you know, this is a privilege. You know, you're lucky to be in this position. What yeah. an opportunity to help defend America. And to me, I, I tried to inspire them. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes yeah. it doesn't. <laughs> But to me, I always really felt that because, you know, what an opportunity, you, you, you know, you, you were given to do a kind of really unique job. How do we not get bogged down in process, though? How do yeah. we you talk uh, a bit about it. creativity? Yep. Yeah. You know, we've got to be flexible. We've got to be creative. But, you know, there's there's a big difference between innovation and creativity That's to right. the process versus improvising and winging it. And so, when do uh, we make that distinction? I love that. And so, you know, one of the things that when I, when I kind of came up with the idea of process, you know, cause I'm like, all right, people are going to blanch immediately. Oh my God, everyone hates process. Yeah. But in, in the, when, in the book, the kind of the example I gave again on a surveillance detection route. And, and I gave an example of, I was in North Africa and I was stuck on an SDR and I, I, I was missing timing hacks. So mm -hmm. I actually didn't make an agent meeting. So when I come back and I say, okay, so I had to respect the process, but the creativity would be, you know what? Why am I taking a vehicle? Mm -hmm. Really crappy traffic in North Africa. What if we change a little bit of a mindset? Let's 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 some, let's go out and buy a, a motorcycle. You can weave throughout traffic. Yeah, you know. So that's that's respecting the process. That's the that's the fundamentals. That surveillance detection route. But hey, we're going to do something to allow us to get the job done. And so let's go get a. a mo and th this literally happens. Someone sitting around in the station bullpen say. Hey, let's 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 grab some motorcycles. And I was like, "That's a great idea." And yeah. I'm like, and then I'm thinking, like, how am I going to get approval from headquarters <laughs> to get people trained? Because you know, someone back home is going to oh, yeah, be like, yeah. "Oh my God, we're, someone's going to get hurt yeah. riding a bike." We're not trained on we're not motorcycles. trained on motorcycles. You have to wear a helmet. Yes, it's right? like, oh, yes. so I'm the only guy in the whole country wearing a helmet on a motorcycle. Wearing, like, like, and, you know, why don't we make it red so everyone can yeah. follow you as well? But that's the kind of thing. So so innovation is really important. So you know, respecting that process piece, but but you know, innovating along the way, and that goes to you know more on the leadership piece is being open minded when you when you're sitting around saying, hey, let's solve this problem. Yeah. Um, so you so so the, you know the officers in the station are, are you know are like, hey, boss, like we can't make these, we can't run our SDRs. Traffic's killing us. Let's find a, let's find a solution on this. Respecting yeah. that process, all of a sudden everyone's driving motorcycles. Yeah, versus winging it and saying, well, we're just not going to do them. Right. You know, and then that that's yeah. going to break down. Humility is best served uh, warm. That's an excellent. And I, you had some feedback that you openly discussed here that I wanted to throw out. Oh, yeah. And I, I thought this was great. <laughs> you said you received feedback once that Mark thinks he knows far more than he actually does. And then the, the next one was that uh, Mark must understand that his words carry huge weight at the agency and he is so respected as such, he should choose much more wisely and fully think before he speaks. I really like this because I've received that exact same the feedback famous, over my career. Yep, the famous 360 <laughs> feedback sessions. Oh my God. So, you know, you, you embrace those kind of that feedback because it, it really is going to make you, you know, a, a better officer at, at the end of the day. But what, you know, the, the humility piece, you know, so a lot of people ask me, you know, what's the, uh, uh, you know, the, the best character trait, of a, of a CIA, you know, of, a, of an operations officer. And I, I, the first thing that comes to mind is humility mm -hmm. and everyone, you know, but people think we have these type A personalities, same as your old, your old yeah. world. But I think a lot of people don't understand is that humility is, is absolutely critical because this is, you know, there's, there's, you know, high, you know, uh, uh, you know, high rate of return on operations, but then huge, you know, a huge rate of, of risk as well. And so, um, you know, you can't go through your career with having some incredible highs, but some incredible lows as well. And so being humble is important because then you don't believe your own hype. Right. You know, I, I tell the story of, uh, you know, I was I was running a, a counterterrorism unit based out of headquarters and we were having huge success against Al Qaeda. 
Um, this is a time when, if you remember, you know, back in what was the 2014 time period where there was a huge threat to civil aviation around mm-hmm. the world from Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. It's a yeah. Al Qaeda offshoot, and I was responsible for you know helping take care of that along with military partners. And and we'd done some things that you know that that caught the attention of the White House. So I was up on the seventh floor and I was getting lauded by everybody, and I was the shit, you know. And and so uh, you know, and th- you know what happened a week later. We we, uh, we screwed up an op and incurred, as you know, the, the term civcast, civilian casualties, yeah. and that's as in your world and in my world, that is not good. Yeah. And there is huge eyes on you. So all of a sudden, all the people who thought I was so great now think I'm the you know the biggest turd around. Um. And so I, I you know I went up to the the seventh floor of our headquarters and I kind of you know uh, uh, I had to brief the director and the deputy director of the agency and I think it was forty other leaders, uh, leadership team there and I I did three things. First of all, I said it's on me. I own it. Um, you know, I, so that's, that's a lot of, you know, that's kind of the idea of ownership. Uh, these are the three things that happened. And then these are the three things, how we fixed it. Mm-hmm. And I asked there any questions and there was none. And as I walked out, um, uh, the, the deputy director of operations at the time came up to me and he said, he, he said, uh, well, I said to him, I said, I, I, you know, if you want to remove me from this position, I got it. I yeah. screwed up. He's like, not at all. And I said, well, there are no questions. And he goes, yeah, because you owned it. You told him what went wrong. You told him how you're going to fix it. Yeah. And you were humble. And that idea of humility is, is something that is, you know, that, that I think people don't understand how much we all have um, because you know, a lot of bad things happen. And so collectively over time, you can't walk around thinking you're a badass because there's, there's, some, there's some stuff around the corner that's going to bite you. And, and you also, you know, you, wanna, you, you want to, uh, to make sure your kind of decision making stays sound as well. If you think too highly of yourself. Uh, I think you're going to make mistakes. Well, and you brought up the a couple of other points: accountability, responsibility, yep. ownership, and you know also terms widely thrown around. But it, you can't have accountability or responsibility or ownership if you don't have humility in the first place right. to say that yeah, this is my lane, this is my remit, this is what I'm responsible for. It went well, it didn't go well. It doesn't right. matter which one. I'm going to be there to assume responsibility no matter what. It, you're not going to ever be able to stand up and say, yes, this is what happened and this is why and this is what we're going to do next if you're looking for somebody else to pin something on right. all the time. Right. I mean, you know, great leaders, you know, own their mistakes. They don't deflect. Yep. They don't kind of push it on others. Now, this is not, you know, uh, ubiquitous within the agency or in the soft world. You know that. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of people who don't do this. Oh, absolutely. So, I, and, and, and one of these things, the, the key thing on the book is I'm not writing a treaty on the greatness of the CIA and these leadership principles. A lot of people don't practice these. Um, what I, you know, these are things that I learned over time. Um, and, but I want to kind of pass this on to others because, you know, a lot of this was, was born out of, out of watching, um, you know, particularly some of my old bosses do some yeah. of the things that I don't <laughs> preach in there. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. I want to bring up the next one, which is probably the hardest, sure. honestly, in, in my opinion, when you call it win an Oscar. Yeah. And you said, as a leader, there's simply no night off. You're always under the spotlight. Yep why do you have to win an Oscar and what does that mean? So again, and this, this goes back to the notion of when times are tough, when there's a, you know, when, when, you know, when there's a crisis situation, everyone's looking at you period. So, you know, you got to embrace that. Um, key points on this is, you know, you have to stay authentic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, I tell the story, I can't remember if it was in the book or not, but it's, it's what I, what I just think about all the time is, you know, I was at an embassy, I was a deputy station chief in the middle East and, and the embassy was attacked by Al Qaeda. Um, you know, car bomb hit the back gate, didn't detonate. And then there was a, a kind of a frontal assault. They're lobbing grenades on, on our roof. Uh, uh, and everyone, you know, I don't care, you know, and I, you know, I've been in uh, Iraq before I've been in Afghanistan before I was still terrified. And oh, if you're not scared of yeah. that, you're lying. Right. Um, I say that all the time. there was a soft contingent with us, you know, kind of an augment, you know, uh, 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 augmentees as well. And everyone is like, this is not good. Right. Um, but so, so the reason why I, I raise this is that, you know, I, I kind of calmly opened the weapon safe, pass out the weapons. Um, but I got up in front of everybody and I didn't say, Hey, this is, this is going to be okay. I didn't say that at all. I was like, Hey, this is, this is a, you know, this might not go so well, but we've trained for this. Everyone's prepared for this. Um, we kind of, we knew something like this might, might happen. So, you know, we're going to do our best to get out of this situation. I was authentic. And afterwards I got a lot of good feedback on that. The irony of course, is when someone said, Hey, you looked really calm. And I was like, I was crap in my pants. <laughs> I was going to die that day. Yeah, I was exactly. terrified. Um, but again, it's the, it's the idea of that all eyes are, are, are upon you. So, you know, I, I once gave this uh, a, a leadership talk, and I, I mentioned this. It was a, it was a, a group of healthcare executives mm-hmm. and one uh, entrepreneurs, actually, and some of them became very successful. But, but one um, one CEO came to me and said, "Hey, that really resonated to me. I remember one time where, the, where our business was so bad, I didn't think I could make payroll." And I said, "What? You know, that week?" He goes, "No, that day." Right. And I had to look at my employees and said, "I don't know if I can pay you." Now yeah. they all have mortgages and families, but I had to get up there and be authentic. And I, and I said, "I'm going to do everything possible." 
But you know what? Um, uh, this is a bad situation. I, and I thought that was a perfect kind of encapsulation of what this what this means. It's being authentic. It's telling the truth. Um, but it's also showing some strength yeah. uh, uh, as well. Now, wh- where does this go wrong? Well, this goes wrong if a leader panics. And, right. and you know, uh, go back to that same situation. I won't use any names. Um, uh, you know, we had, we had a Marine security guard, guard detachment uh, uh, at the embassy. And they, they, uh, their, their, uh, their gunny, their gunnery sergeant, had just came from, come back from uh, Iraq. And he was not doing well. And he completely collapsed um, and, and you, know, f- you know, kind of turtled up at that time. And these are the guys who are primarily responsible for this security. For security. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, so I, 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 again, not using any names, but that yeah. was an example of not doing um, what he should have. And we, in fact, we had, again, we had some, some folks from the soft community who really stepped up. And um, I think we tried to get one of them a, a, a medal, but the State Department wouldn't do it because then they'd have to kind of recognize their own failings. Yeah, a- acknowledge yeah. that something bad <laughs> happened yeah. here. Yeah, what are you talking about? Right. Was, yeah. These guys came to work. Yeah, we call it, we call it emotional strength. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's in, in the in the nine that Soft uses. It's about emotional right. strength and how do you stay calm in in these times of chaos. You know, the, the but other, also be authentic too, right? Exactly. Yeah. The yeah. the other side of that though is you can't be an emotionless robot. That's right. You know, who yep. sits there and you know whether somebody comes and gives you good news, bad news, you stare at them no, blankly right. and nod your head and right. say yes. Yeah. You know, we've got to be able to to create so, show that we're we have emotion and and are able to articulate that because that's what brings people together. One of the hardest things for me on this one, again, and I, and I think this is you know I, I give that example about the embassy, but this the, the, the you know I really thought of this at a time where I, where and you probably have dealt with this as, as well. The kind of the worst parts of the job is getting up and telling teammates or colleagues someone has died. Yeah. Um, and that that to me was was one of the hardest moments in my career where I you know and it was. You know, after the events um, in coast Afghanistan mm-hmm. on December 30th, 2009, when seven of our colleagues had died and I had to get up in front of a station and tell them one of our, you know, uh, you know, someone who was a station member had, had passed beyond describable, kind of the reaction of folks. And what I had to do as the leader of that station to try to hold it together. That was really difficult. Yeah. Um, and now, I, you know, I remember feeling, you know, this is, again, kind of my own journey, feeling sorry for myself. Years later, I was I, I was talking to uh, John Abizade, who was the former yeah. deputy of CENTCOM. I think his last job was ambassador in Saudi Arabia, and and he was visiting the Middle East uh, uh, after after he retired from the military before he came back as an ambassador. Um, but I but I kind of I was you know just going through my own thing, and I was telling him, hey, that was a really hard time for me. And he looked at me, it kind of put me in my place correctly. He said, you know, Mark, you know, I, I do this on an industrial scale, and I was like, whoa, yeah. Um, but anyway, but uh, but I think winning an Oscar is a, a yeah. is, is certainly an important one. Well, I think it ties closely to the next one, which is family values, yeah. because one of the key jobs that a leader has, as you describe, is to create what you call the soul. Yep. And that soul is is the ethos of the organization. It what it's what brings everybody together. And so after you've put all this work in to create this tight team, yep. how do you then not succumb to being a member? You, you have to still oh, that's lead hard. it, that's right? right? Yeah. So talk a bit about family values, sure. what that means and why camaraderie becomes so important. Well, you know, you know, you know, particularly with a place like the agency, there's not a deep bench. So you look to your left and your right of you at a station or a base somewhere. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're an embassy or if you're, in a conflict zone, and you know that's those are the people you're going to battle with, and so you know that that's your that's your team right there. But the you know the what was always um, uh, uh, you know really important to me was 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 having and I, and I use this word and people get uncomfortable, but you have kind of you have your love for your fellow yeah. brothers and sisters there, and and I use this word all I, I started using it recently in talks, and I wasn't sure how people would um, would uh, would relate to it, and but the the reaction has been extraordinary because I believe it. But you ha- you know there's a love you have with with people when you go through kind of these, you know, baptisms under, under fire, whatever it is. Um, and, and so it's the idea of high performing teams absolutely need to have that sense of a sense of camaraderie. So the question really is how do you build that? Right. Um, and, and, you know, it, you, you, just, you kind of, you do, you do it kind of patiently over time. The old adage of, Hey, everyone go out to the bar. Well, that doesn't really work <laughs> now. You know, one of the things that, I mean, it's, 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 it happened, but you know, one of the things that, that I started doing at the end of my career is I, I gather my team together and I would be like, oh, we're not talking about work, but five minutes, everyone's got five minutes. Tell us about, some, tell us about yourself that we don't know. What do you do? Like, what are your passions? Right. Um, and it was really powerful. So a couple of things happens. You know, people learn about each other and it's, it's a way of kind of a bonding experience. But then, but then in the back of my mind, I, here's what I started learning. People started saying things about their background that later on work-wise I could use. Right. And so let me, yeah. a, a great example would be, um, I remember that we had one officer and, and she said, you know, I played division one soccer. 
And I said, I never knew that. She goes, yeah, that, you know, soccer is my passion. The agency, this is, you know, this is kind of a little hobby, but I, I, you know, I love being a soccer player for a national champ, you know, national championship caliber team. Later on, we had a target uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, in front of us. And it was a, it was a, uh, uh, you know, intelligence officer from a, from a hostile country, that intelligence officer, what did they love? Yeah. They loved soccer. soccer. And I was like, hold on a second. Yeah. I have someone now who is a legit badass, probably yeah. could have pl- played uh, professionally. And then we use that case officer now, um, marrying it up, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, with that target, you know, whatever happens, happens. But, but again, it's the idea of building those teams and getting to know your, um, uh, you know, the people you have. And, and, you know, there's so many kind of you know, points in my, in my career where that kind of that camaraderie, that tightness really helped me. I told a story about when I came back from Iraq, I had terrible uh, post-traumatic stress from all the kind of the bad stuff, I guess we saw and did. Um, and the, the station chief out in Baghdad, he came back home. My wife called him and said, I've been, I've been gone for six months. I came back. I was having these terrible nightmares, seeing dead bodies everywhere. And she's like, something's really wrong with Mark. Mm-hmm. And his name was Charlie Seidel. And he, he then called us all back up, the original Baghdad team, the infill in Baghdad, called us up to his, his uh, house up in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, um, under the guise of a reunion. But he did it really right. just for me. Yeah. And so, and, and for two weeks we're all together and I, it really started my healing process. And then, you know, when I found out what he did later on, it goes back to that. He didn't have to do this. Right. You no, know, that's the family values. That's the type of team and the camaraderie you want to, you want to build. Now you raise something, uh, uh, Fran, that's really, really important is you also are the leader. And if you're leading a unit like that, you know, th- there, you do have to separate yourself and, and I'll, and I'll close with what I used to do at the embassy at the, you know, at the Friday night Marine house parties at 12 o'clock. <laughs> management's going home <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> let the boys and girls go have their fun um but you have to have a little bit of separation yeah it's, it's <laughs> often the hardest thing to do right. too <laughs> it's a witching hour exactly Midnight, yeah. no, leave, nothing, leave nothing good happens after yeah, that no. time yeah. yeah go go back to your room you're right. better off <laughs> the next one is, is is be a people developer yeah. And he said, many leaders become so engrossed in strategy and execution that we forget that we are a teacher first and foremost. And I I talk about this a lot with organizations because especially in competitive businesses, competitive industries, you know, when resources are constrained, which, you know, businesses will often tell me, well, you know, I need more people. I need more money. And I look at them and I say, every business needs more people and more money. Right. Okay. Absolutely. It doesn't matter how profitable they are, how unprofitable they are. They're always going to tell you, I need more people. I need more money, but they're under pressure. And when leaders become under pressure, which by and large, they usually always are, they will not focus on the development of their people. Oh, and, always. And that, that's the first thing that goes, in fact. That and yep. hiring, the, right. a, yep. a, a, a strong recruiting yeah. and hiring process. And everything goes to the back burner. Okay, well, I'll interview this person. You know, I got 20 minutes in between right. these seven meetings. Right. And, you know, okay, put their resume in the calendar invite. And the first five minutes of the interview, you, they're reading their resume and they're distracted by other stuff. And so we don't hire well. And that perpetuates the problem now. And same with training. Okay, well, we'll do training when we have time. Yep. Well, okay, well, six months later, do you train? No, we don't no, have time. We don't have time. Why is it so important? Well, I mean, it, it, it you know, because you're always looking to the future. And so what does the future mean? It means you're passing the torch. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we don't and, get to be there forever. <laughs> and, right. And, and, and developing others. And so, you know, the idea, the thing about the discipline it requires to have that, that correct onboarding and training when, when, you know, uh, uh economic times are bad or you don't have resources or, or money. Um, but you know, one of the, th- I, the, the, with this principle, I kind of, you know, we we're joking around, you know, down in, uh, in my basement, everyone has that, you know, kind of that wall that I yeah. love me wall <laughs> with all the medals and all the pictures and all the kind of fancy stuff. And, and that's great. And I always say, Hey, you, anyone can come over, welcome to have a bourbon. We'll go take a look at that stuff. But no one actually is going to remember me for that. Mm-hmm. So what are they going to remember me as, um, who I, again, I thought I was a pretty good leader at the end of my career. And, uh, you know, I was doing a, a book signing, um, a, you know, a, a year or so ago and, and an officer who's now station chief came up there and he said to my son and he said, uh, you know, your dad was the best leader I ever had. And he said, why? Um, uh, my son was proud and he was interested and he goes, cause he prepared me all the time. And he told this story and I put it in the book when I was a base chief in Afghanistan, you know, I'm allowed to travel around the country. And if I do so, I don't have to write a cable saying, you know, I, you know, I've got to turn it over the base over to someone else. Right. So, so if I'd go to Kabul for 48 hours, I, I, and I, and I, let's say I had 10 case officers each and you know, over the course of the year, each of them for 48 hours would run the base. What does that mean? That means, you know, directing, you know, return fire. We're getting mm-hmm. rocketed every day from, you know, from Pakistan, 107, seven millimeter rockets. So, Hey, you're the one who's going to, they're our friends. They're our friends. Yeah. Don't, don't get me going <laughs> on that. Um, 
uh, literally for an entire year, every day, I got shot at by by Al Qaeda and the Taliban from PAC military yeah. positions. Yeah, yeah, go it's figure. Sh- that. Shocking. Um, <laughs> so I said, so, so you're going to be responsible for returning fire. There's going to be, you know, we're going to run agents. There's going to be high value target uh, operations. You're going to you're going to have to recommend calling in airstrikes or not. But this is what for 48 hours, you know, you're going to do this. And so the story is this. So th- this this young officer and I, I, you know, I put him in charge and I'm jumping on the helo to leave. And he looks at me and he says, hey, I'm, hey, boss, you know, I'll, I'll hold down the fort when you're gone. And of course, I'm not recommending this. I grabbed him by his shirt and, <laughs> you know, you know, kind of threw some expletives at him um, and scared the crap out of him. But I said, absolutely not. He said, you're, you're making every decision. Now, when I come back, we'll go over what you did as a teaching point. But, right. but you know, when I come back, we're hitting the ground running. And he mentioned that, that story to my son. He said that was really helpful because it showed that, you know, what Mark cared about was developing us more. Mm-hmm. Than you know, than any kind of awards. You know, who cares about the record? I mean, the record books and stuff like that. Or you know, if you're if you're a baseball player, did you hit 300 or not? No, I mean, you you know, it's it's passing the torch to the next generation. And to me, especially at the end of my career, that idea of mentoring was you know you know meant so much more because because guess what? You know, you're going to be remembered by officers who you helped like that yeah. much, and you and the organization is going to get better much more than did I win some medal or something like that. Again, that's for me drinking a bourbon when I'm kind of <laughs> old and. <laughs> and then, you know, frail down the basement. We use the term effective intelligence because that's that the the aggregate sum of experiences that you've had right. in your past is what shapes your decision making in the future and oh, informs huge. you. Yeah. And then when we ha- and we have to pass that on. Yep. If we don't pass that on, right. it goes with us and we're not using that as teaching points to develop that next generation. And then we're in this cr- this course of action of hopefully, and if you remember, it, I'm sure it's similar in your training. If we ever briefed, hopefully, uh, you were you were kicked oh, out of the room. Don't, you know, don't, don't, hopefully, the hope. enemy will retreat. You so, know, like, so, you no, know, hope is not a strategy. That's <laughs> right. the famous thing. I, I mean, hope is something. I hope they don't ever do that. <laughs> yeah, I, that's and that's a big thing in the sports world too. I hope we win today. Oh, yeah. oh coach will go crazy if you say that. Yeah, you know, no, absolutely. Um, now, so, but 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 again, passing the torch to me was was something that that uh, was really important and really special and. Um, I, you know, I hope that's what I'm remembered for is developing others. Um, and that's why, you know, that when I, when I give this talk and I, you know, I, and, or, you know, talking about kind of this, some of the stuff I did in my career, some of the awards I've won, that really doesn't matter to me, mm-hmm. uh, as much as how, you know, how I'm thought by some of the, you know, the young officers I, I mentored along the way. And by the way, mentorship is, you know, and, and the CIA is a lot different than the military. We have, we have a really crappy training, you know, so you all as an officer, you might go what, you know, you'll go to what, you know, command and staff colleges, you'll do probably two years in your 20 right two two years offline if you're going to the what uh oh uh, you know way more or even more than that way, oh, we do yeah. n- in the agency we do none of that so so what i'm talking about you know, what i learned was that we, we got to do it on our own yeah. and that's really important and so that's why you know kind of uh, you know leaders can especially in, in my old place really affect um you know positive development by just by taking this you know you know a uh, uh, mantle on their own and doing it because we're not doing it in terms of of sending folks off yeah. offline now we i talked about i was actually just talking about this this week because you know we we'll talk to people about hiring processes right and they'll say oh, speed the hiring process you know just streamline the interviews you know get it done and i look at them and i say listen i spent two years training and screening where any day i could have been kicked out right. to become a green beret yep and you want to hire somebody after a 45 minute zoom interview right is that really the process that you want to put in nope. place? Right. You know, we really, you, know, you got to think about those things. Recognition and competition are so important yeah. in the development of teams. You called it employ the, the dagger. dagger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how, how do you effectively create competition and recognize those who work for you without creating internal sure. strife? So, you know, I, 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 well, someone told me one time when I, when I, I talk about this principle, they said, okay, somehow you have to make this idea of competition being healthy. You have to make it applicable to like a librarian. And I was like, whoa, that was awesome because that challenged me. I'm right. like, okay, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to try. But again, it's, it's just the notion that, that you, know, uh, you know, competition actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, allows for an entire team to rise mm-hmm. together. And that's not something that's, that's all that new. But, you know, how do you do this in a healthy fashion is, is really important. And one of the things that, that I used to, and, and again, I did it informally. So this is not performance, you know, uh, appraisals. It's not, it's not a, uh, you know, a monetary award, right. that, you know, we could do at the agency. I, I, I'm not sure if you all could do that in the military, but and it's, it's not promotion, but it's the idea I would, I, you know, so if, so if someone recruited, you know, an agent, um, if, if they kind of helped affect the high value target, uh, uh, operation, or, or maybe they even, you know, assisted with, with doing counter surveillance, I would actually go out on the streets in the middle East. I go to the souk, the bazaar, and I buy a little $10, $10 dagger. Mm-hmm. 
And so I, what I would do is every week I'd give this to someone. Um, and what, what was amazing to me is all of a sudden they're actually vying for that. This little right. kind of yeah. crappy little $10 dagger. And it became this symbol in the station. Well, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I wasn't the greatest leader in the world in the beginning, but I'm thinking, well, wait a second, I'm, I'm onto something here because mm-hmm. this is really interesting. And, and actually it made me feel good because it's not chasing a promotion or chasing money. It's doing something that, that the, everyone was really embracing. And then everyone kind of rises up together. And I, I used to do something, you know, along the lines of the stand up morning meeting. Mm-hmm. There's tons of kind of research on this in the business world. And I don't know any of this, you know, in great detail, but for me it was, Hey, what'd you do last night? I'm not telling you what you had to do, right. but, but a CIA case officer works at night. So, you know, and, Hey, someone can take a night off and be with their family. That's okay. But what, but if they do that a second or a third time, do I say anything to them? No, their peers do. Right. Everyone's looking at them. Well, hold on, yeah. you know, you know, you gotta, you gotta pull your weight here. And so it's just, it's the idea that it kind of, everybody kind of rises up with, with healthy competition. And I thought that was, that was important on the, on the librarian piece. I'm still trying to figure out how to explain this. Um, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe this, this, the stack is, is clean or something like that or, or, or organized. Uh, uh, but ultimately this is something that, that I found in, you know, in the sports world, it's everywhere. It's, um, uh, you know, you see, I don't know, uh, you know, every, every baseball team has this, you know, uh, you see, you know, uh, I think the, uh, Boston Red Sox this year, they were, they were, they had this like laundry cart. Someone hits a home run, they get plopped in the uh-huh. cart and they kind of go down the, the dugout. It's just these, these things you see that someone's wearing some kind of funny hat or something like that. But it, you know, the teams, teams employ this and they employ it very, very, uh, uh, successfully because it's just, it's the idea of kind of rewarding, rewarding behavior that you want to really promote. And it helps build those family values yeah. that you talked about. To sum it up, you have termed clarity right. in the shadows. How do we now bring it all together? So, so it's, uh, the the nine principles that I talked about, and again, pe- people probably remember if they're if they're reading the book, they got all nine. If they're remembering anything, they'll remember three. <laughs> um, but it, but all these kind of build on each other. It's not sequential in order. But so, what happens in the end? And again, the end is you have an ability um, to thrive as a leader under high pressure situations, and uh, uh, and that's something that you know that you can actually train yourself to do. But and these are just basic principles. Again, you know, what kind of processes do you have? What kind of family values have you built? Um, have you embraced adversity? And I, and I, you know, I, I, the, the kind of the best way to, to, to encapsulate this is a story. When I was, I was back from Afghanistan, um, uh, I was called to our operations center and my team was still on the ground, but I was, I was two or three weeks, you know, uh, or uh, gone. I probably came back from R and R and, and someone said, Hey, you, you know, your, your team's got a high value target on the X. And I said, okay, great. We've been looking for this guy for a long time. And they said, yeah, but it, it's all screwed up. I'm like, what's screwed up the team? They said, no, no, no. We, we lost comms with them. ISR is down, like everything at headquarters, everyone was a mess. We don't know what right. to do. And I said, okay, so, so, you know, what, wh- what have they briefed you on? And they kind of told me, and I said, and I'm thinking back, I said, okay, this is a team that, um, that was super tight, nailed all the processes. You know, I'd given them all these mentorship opportunities. Yeah. We'd been through incredible adversity already for just a, a variety of reasons, you know, it was in, a, in a combat zone. And so I'm going through it. I'm like, I think they're fine. Like, you know, y- y'all should approve this. And they're like, how right. can you say this? And I'm like, well, and I kind of walked him through and, and a very senior officer came up to me and he said, Hey, what's your recommendation? We brought you here because you're the former base chief. And I said, yeah, do it. No, like, you know, give him, give him the okay. Um, and he, and he looked at me, he goes, if you're wrong, this is your career. And I'm like, I don't even work here. Right. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> you asked me my yeah, opinion. My I, was, opinion. I was at my house. <laughs> and then he goes, too bad. You're on, you know, you're on the, you're on the X right now. And I said, we'll do it. And it was, it was a success. And they, and they, they removed the, uh, the, the, uh, the HVT from the battlefield. And afterwards, one of my buddies said to me, he goes, why did you, why were you comfortable making that decision? Aside from the fact that we knew you would anyway, cause you were challenged and you're right. just, you know, <laughs> you're, you're going to do that anyway. But, and I, and I kind of walked him through my thinking on it. So again, it's, it's the idea of putting these all together and having that, just that ability to, uh, to see things clearly when, when others can't. And, and, you know, when you're in that gray zone and it's, and it, it again, it's freeing. Um, it's something you can train for, you know, you follow these principles, but I think it, it's, you know, you think about, Look, look what happened this last year. I, you could, I, could, I could go over this if we had more time and talk about COVID. Yeah. You know, in our response to go, what companies, what organizations responded well to the COVID crisis? And those, I think, employed a lot of these principles yeah. because there was so much uncertainty in the world there in the business community, in people's lives, their health, their right. families. And so um, it's, 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 uh, it's putting it all together. Yeah. So we dug into your, your leadership principles. You've termed it clarity in crisis. We, we talked a lot about your long and distinguished career over 26 years at the agency, but your service still continues. And the challenges that you face you know, to your own personal story and, sure. and your leadership continue. And in December of 2017, you were woken up one night with the room spinning, ringing in your ears, vertigo, you threw up, 
You've had headaches ever since. Right. It's been five years. What's going on? So, you know, this is part, and I certainly, I don't address this in the book and my leadership yeah. talks, I, I don't as well, because I want to keep these two things separate because this is yeah. kind of this, you know, this kind of miserable journey I've been on. But ultimately, you know, I was, uh, you know, the last two years of my career, I was the operations chief um, for, for in Europe and Eurasia, which is responsible for everything from, you know, Dublin to all the way to the Eastern time zone of, uh, of Russia. But it was primarily, um, you know, combating Russian influence in yeah. Europe. And of course, you know, uh, what, what, you know, what, uh, uh, and a lot having to do with Ukraine as well. Um, although I miss that fight, which drives me nuts. Yeah. I, was, I would do anything to be there right now. Um, but ultimately, uh, uh, you know, I went, I went on a trip to Moscow in December of 2017 to meet with the embassy. Um, I had been a career Middle East officer, so I needed kind of just to get some, you know, some situational awareness some an air, you know, area familiarization trip. Yeah. I was going to manage all these, uh, you know, uh, all these kind of disparate um, uh, offices. I had to go, you know, visit them along the way. And uh it, we also had what was called, you know, liaison a relationship, um, a bad one, but we did have a liaison with the Russian security services. Right. So, we, you know, I- even in the worst times in the Cold War, we still talk to them as we do now, which is the right thing to do right? Um, to kind of, you know, manage crises. But, you know, as I think it was December 5th, I woke up in the middle of the night um, with the room spinning, uh, you know, splitting migraine, tinnitus, which is ringing in my mm-hmm. ears, um, vertigo. And it's it started this kind of five year journey. And what what uh, you know, I believe happened was uh, uh, similar to what happened to our officers in, in uh, our U.S. diplomats in Havana, Cuba in 2016, the year prior, which is that there was some kind of, you know, uh, some kind of attack on us. No, it's a sonic attack, directed energy, whatever it is. Um, but ultimately, you know, I ended up, you know, through a long kind of miserable fight with the, with the organization. I had to retire because of this. Um, but ultimately, I ended up at Walter Reed's National Intrepid Center of Excellence, which is you know, they're, you know, kind of the world's preeminent traumatic brain injury program, which a lot yep. of your colleagues have gone yep. through as well. And I went through with them. I was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury from some kind of external event. And I've had this kind of this, uh, you know, this journey, this kind of this, this journey on healthcare um, and trying to fix myself, uh, which has been, it's been, you know, pretty awful. I'm getting better. Um, but, you know, I don't have the bandwidth I did, you know, after this talk, I'll be tired. Right. Um, one of the, one of the things that helps me actually is exercise and lifting weights and going on a walk. So I'll probably do that after, after you all leave. But, uh, it's been, it's, it's, it's been a pretty more remarkable journey for me, um, in terms of battling chronic pain. And, and, and then, you know, most importantly is, you know, understanding what U S military has gone through in with two decades of war because of my time at, you know, my one month at, at NICO, um, and, and, you know, what, what traumatic brain injury really means. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of broken folks out there and, yeah. and how we as a kind of a, as a country really kind of address this is, is, a, is really important. And so uh, I'm still trying, I'm still, still, still plugging away. I'm much better. Um, right. but I've, uh, you know, I'm, I, I still have these headaches it's been five years to come December 17th, five years. Well, the interesting thing about this, you know, as they've termed it Havana syndrome right. or, or pulsed electromagnetic energy attacks, right. microwave attacks, whatever it may be. There's been no consensus from the U.S. government. And, you know, I know you've been on and, and spoken about sure. this, you know, on on a number of media outlets. But and there's and there's, there has been open and closed investigations. There's some new investigations right. that are that are pending and these case studies. But nobody's come together, whether it be at the White House or DOD or Department of State, right. and said this is what's going on. So there's, there's a lot of kind of sure. finger pointing and throwing their hands yep. up. And yet there's a thousand or so cases of this, like yourself, of people who are saying, hey, something happened. Something happened. I mean, I, I look I look back. And so, you know, the, the inspiration for me comes from, from frankly, from the DOD personnel um, and a couple levels. One is think about what happened in Vietnam with Agent Orange. Uh-huh. Then you had Gulf War Syndrome. Yeah. Um, then you had burn pits. Yeah. You know, I, I was I just, you know, I was I was at a. I did a, a media appearance or a media uh, uh, a hit talking about, you know, Russia, Ukraine, and John Stewart just happened to be there earlier talking about his, you know, advocacy for, for burn pit victims, really inspirational. So, so a lot, there, you know, there are things that have happened in the past in which, you know, a lot of U S military, uh, 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 you know, enlisted and, and, and officers have really suffered. And then ultimately they find out what it is and they've been treated. And so I kind of put it in that, um, in that category. And I'll, and I'll tell you that the, the one organization that really does believe those of us on this and is leading the way is, is DOD. Yeah. Um, you know, there's no doubt uh, in my mind. I remember, you know, after I retired, I had a beer with Chris, Mil- uh, Chris Miller. Uh, we had Chris Miller. Right? Oh, you did? Yeah. 20 episode 20. It's like, it's like in our top, like two or three episodes. And yeah. so, Chris Miller was awesome. uh, you know, and someone who actually I had met, you know, uh, and we, we were kind of going over like, Hey, have we ever kind of seen each other? Yeah. I'd met him in the infill into Iraq. Yeah. Um, he completely, he was in, in Afghanistan too. Yep. Yeah. Completely believes this. 
And I said, why do you believe this? He goes, because one of my guys from, from the old, uh, his old world in, in, uh, in special forces was affected by this too. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the DOD labs have been really kind of prominent in, in leading the way. And so, you know, so ultimately I think it's something that, that, you know, we're going to get to the bottom of, but the most important part is treating yeah. people who, you know, so it, what's, it, this goes back to leadership. If, if, if someone comes to you and says, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not doing so hot. Do you dismiss them? Uh, you know, uh, uh, because you don't know what happened. No, you get them help. Right. And that's what didn't happen for, for myself and for others. It was a massive leadership fail. Um, and, you know, I, I had the, so people said to me, you know, it was very courageous. I actually came out in public. Uh, uh, and and because when, when I was trying to get to Walter Reed and the agency wasn't, it was denying it. I came out in public on this and I said, what my response is, this wasn't courageous. I was desperate. Right. You know, and so you know, when you go through that program and, you know, I was, I was diagnosed with a TBI and that's, this is, this is from, from Walter Reed, who had the, you know, the world, you know, renowned experts on this. And, 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 you know, as going through there, one of the things that was most powerful to me was at the end of this program, um, uh, they bring your family in. And, uh, and again, this is, this is chronic pain that I've battled for, you know, for years. Sounds familiar. I mean, this is something right. I think probably some of your colleagues have, have uh, experienced as well. But they asked her, your, you know, your, in this case, my spouse, they said, you know, did you think Mark would, was ever going to hurt himself? Meanwhile, I had gone there. Every day you walk into NICO and they said, do you want to kill yourself yesterday? I say, no, my head fucking hurts. Right. <laughs> but no. Yeah. Yeah. But she, she had a very different answer. She said, I'm really scared what's going to happen with him. It reminded me that time, you know, when I came back from Iraq in 03 uh, with, with kind of that, those, those PTS syndrome and uh, uh, symptoms. And so ultimately um, that was, you know, that to me was, was really powerful. She was really worried about me. And so what NICO, uh, you know, did in the end was give me the kind of tools on how I kind of, you know, deal with this now. And I've gotten some other kind of specialized treatment with some old Naval Special Warfare docs down at Virginia Beach who have really helped me. So yeah. it's a... Uh, uh, it's been a it's pretty, been a pretty kind of crazy ride, but again, it's the it's the idea of you know if I can advocate for healthcare for those um, who have been through this, that's what that's what's most important. And and I'll tell you know the, and there's there is every when I was when I was at NICO, I remember going across the street um, uh, uh, to the the PT rehab uh, mm-hmm. place. And it, it, you know if you ever if you want to ever want to be humbled, you know you go there and you see kind of the you know folks with prosthetics and yeah you don't have it that bad no you don't have it that bad but and, and i was and, and but that's the, the place where i was getting some physical therapy as well and I, one of the docs there um i said to her uh she said who are you and i said oh i'm a, from across the street you know i'm from oga which everyone knows yeah. other government agency that's the moniker for the agency and, and she goes oh you're one of those um with the with the you know the havana syndrome stuff and i said well not really yeah but how do you know i'm, I'm the second agency patient here like and, and she said oh, i have a whole bunch of other patients from dod and then, of course, I said, "Really?" And then she wouldn't tell me. Right. So this is something that that does exist out there, and we just got to get to the to the bottom of it. Yeah. Well, y- use us as a platform. We're happy to bring awareness yeah, to it. it. I think it's really, I think it's really important. And you know, we this is in that world of you know the two hard box. And as leaders, our job is to destroy the two hard right. box and find solutions to complex challenges. That's right. That's what we do. Yeah, we do hard. You know, that, like, that's what I say all the yeah. time. So, I mean, the idea that we haven't figured this out yet after just a couple of years, you know, it, you know, to me, it's, it, 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 I, I'm mystified why we should quit. That's just not what we do. Well, I'll go back to your, you know, pulling it up here in my notes. I'll go back to what we talked about in the beginning. The, the fundamentals that you talked about. Righteous, difficult, selfless, communicable. Right. So let's get it right. Yeah. Let's get it right Absolutely. for you right. and everybody else. And then uh, let's figure out what it is. And let's go after them. Uh, well, <laughs> so, that, on that. That's what I'm talking about. That's why about. I wish I was, I was still <laughs> so, in. Oh, me too. All our, all every, our, every day. Everyone who's hanging out you know, in, in Ukraine right now. Every time I say that, everyone has a heart attack. Yeah. Um, uh, and I don't know if they are or not. I certainly have a suspicion. But, <laughs> but, 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 but talk, I mean, you know, that's a whole other, probably other separate episode. Yeah. But, but you know what, what's what's most interesting to me is for kind of my my peer group, um, uh, who is a combination of my old world and your old world. Uh, uh, boy, there's a lot of uh, a lot of interest in Ukraine because you know as we went you know the the two decades of the war on terrorism and, and I and I you know really I I still believe we shouldn't have left Afghanistan but there was a lot of ambiguity sure um, and we probably stayed too long in in terms of you know large numbers um, but this is a to me Russia Ukraine is a David versus Goliath story. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, boy, I wish I was there Yeah, with a so. lot of hard work from a lot of people we know. And, you know, starting in 2014, yep. um, this didn't happen overnight. No, no, you know? they've done great work. Yep. And it's, uh, it's, uh, to me, it's, uh, it's, it's inspirational. Yeah. Mark, as we close out, 
the Jedbergs of World War II had to do three things as core foundational tasks. You would call it habits, fundamentals. Mm-hmm. They had to be able to shoot. They had to be able to move. They had to be able to communicate. Right. Great special forces operators have to do it. Great agency case officers have to do it. And type. Today. Yeah, and type. type. Yeah, yeah. You have to, and, and then write the report. <laughs> write a cable. Yeah, good job. You shoot, move, and communicate. Write the report. Cable. Good job. Yep. If they put focus on these things and they did them to the high level, then they could actually apply their focus on more challenges and complex things that came their way throughout the day. What are the three things that you do every day to set the conditions oh, for success it. in your world. So I'm going to, I'm going to steal something from, some, uh, from a friend of mine. Um, his name is, uh, Rob, Rob Lively. I don't know if you know, Rob, okay. he's a former, uh, command sergeant major of the army's most elite unit. Uh, uh which he, he, he would, lo- um, prosthetics. Uh, no, 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 different guy, different guy. Um, but, uh, but Rob calls it, uh, uh, you know, t- taking care of the combat leadership chassis. And I love that. So you wake up in the morning. It's not just three things. It's more than that. But you wake up in the morning. You kind of say, okay, am I here? Am I alive? That's mm-hmm. good. Have some coffee. Mm-hmm. Got it. Um, but then you do a couple things which are actually critical for you to get through the day. Either, either it's just as, as a human but also as a leader. One is hydrate, um, uh, uh, nutrition, sleep. Mm-hmm. You got to make sure you have your sleep component. For me, that's critical. Um, and exercise. Uh, and you know it, it, those, those to me are the absolute fundamentals because what are those? Those are what you can control. Yeah. And the rest of the uncontrollables don't matter. It goes back to the process piece again. But it was, I love that. You know, I've, I've stolen it. I give it in every leadership talk, but it's the combat leadership chassis. It's um, uh, it's kind of those fun- fundamentals along with a little coffee in the morning to get you up. So I like it. I, I have not heard that term. Yeah. So the combat leadership chassis, I yeah. like it. Coffee, hydrate, nutrition, sleep, exercise. It's what you can control. You know, I, we, I, we actually gave, Rob and I went down to uh, the Philly Police Department and we gave that talk, this, this my old Clarity and Crisis talk, but also this to the Philly SWAT uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, team there, which was going through some really tough times. Yeah. What, what they went through with kind of the riots last year, not a political statement, but um, uh, this is what they focused on the most, um, yeah. because they're having trouble with transition. So what's the transition from your, from your, you know, uh, between this high intensity job and going back home. Um, but the idea of just having those things you can control, uh, I, I love that. And, you know, I try to try to practice after this talk today, I'm going to go down and lift a little bit and go on a walk. Cause I mean, you know, yeah. I, I haven't been eat. I'm trying to eat right. Cause I'm getting my belly's getting a little big in my old age. I'm still benching, <laughs> still benching 340. I'm, I got to get back to my, my bench press was 370 in Afghanistan. There I got to get go. back to that, but <laughs> Uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Just don't bounce it off. That's right. <laughs> we talk about these nine characteristics. We've laid out your your nine principles here. We correlated a lot of them. You know, elite performers ha- ha- and great leaders have to demonstrate all of these. If we put them together, there'd be 18 or probably right. 15 because some of them are certainly correlated directly. I think about the nine specifically that soft use. And at the end of these conversations, I think about our conversation sure. and I say, if I had to pick one, you know, what, what would it be that would sum up our conversation and define you? And, and for, for me today, I really think about effective intelligence. I mentioned it you know, a few minutes ago, but it's our ability to take all of these experiences that we've had right. throughout our career, throughout our life in these different situations. And you've had one of the most dynamic careers that exist, not only in the agency or the military, but I mean, just in general, and you've been the most remote places of the world. You've led some of the most complex operations and succeeded at such a high level that has defined where our nation is today by a lot of the work that you've done. But you've now taken those experiences and you you have applied them not only to this generation of warrior, and I'll say that I use that term very importantly, you know, but but the next one as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how you've done that will not only has it shaped where we are today, but your ability to do that will shape the next generation of this country. And I commend you for that. You. We didn't know each other outside right. of a few emails before I came here, but if this conversation proves anything, it is that that lineage, that bond that started with the OSS and the Jedbergs between the what became the agency and what became special forces still exists. Absolutely. I appreciate your hospitality oh, and joining you. me today. And uh, I think I have a new new friend for oh, life. My honor. Thanks, thanks for coming. Appreciate so. it. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks.
American Jedbergs went out to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Director to the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your creator and host, Fran Rochopi. Join us next week for a new episode on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Check us out on YouTube for full episodes, highlights, and other behind-the-scenes content. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Rochopi, Talent War Group, and our sponsor, Jersey Mike Subs, on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send your comments and inquiries to media at talentwargroup.com. As a former member of Special Forces, the Jedberg Podcast donates a percentage of all proceeds to the Green Beret Foundation, supporting America's Special Forces and their families. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow. <laughs>